right, so let's get started. Um, good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody all right? Yeah. Good. good. So tomorrow we have the day off. What's everybody going to do? Taking the dog goes to the dog park. Any, anybody doing anything fun? Anybody going out of town? Silver Dollar City. Where are you going? Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri. I've never been to Silver Dollar City. You're missing out. I, I, yes, you are, Mr. Crane. That, that's what uh, Coach Adcock and the cross-country team, she has a daughter she takes her every year, and she's like, you've got to take your kids there. It's absolutely fantastic. You should go. All right. Well, I'm going to have to make plans to do so. Be careful. Wear your mask. You know, Columbia, Missouri, and the rest of the state, the whole pandemic thing is getting out of control, what they say on the news. All right. So today, I'm excited to present to you uh, King John. And so we're going to talk about King John. Uh, he is considered one of the evilest men in the history of the world. And so the reason that I'm going to present King John to you is because I think context is really important, that you get an idea of why, why it is that we needed to have, or why the British Isles felt the need to put restraints, put limitations on um, these kings. And so I have a short video, about 28 minutes, I'm going to ask that you watch along with me. And then we're going to discuss King John, and there's some things that I'm going to want you to record as we watch it. So if you don't have like pencil and paper out, you might have something to take notes with. Now to take notes, it could be something really simple. Um, here, I'm going to turn my messages off so that you guys don't see all the teachers who are texting me at this time. Um, I, I think what you're going to find is that King John just was this, this awful, awful guy, right? And so context is important. So let's get started. And of course, my messages are still coming up even though I turned it off. Can you guys see those when they pop up? All right, good. I'm not showing your screen yet. All right, good, perfect. I don't want you guys to see those messages from those teachers. All right, so I'm gonna share screen on the other secondary screen that I have. Uh, and I'm gonna give a short presentation, which in, oops, I gotta go back, I gotta change this because I forgot to click a little thing. No, that's not it. Here we go. All right, can you see the screen? Perfect. I can't hear you. Can someone say something? Yeah, we, we can. can see it. All right. Yeah, we, we can, can see it. All right, so the Magna Carta, I'm just telling you, as far as the document is concerned, I'm not all that excited, but I am excited to present to you like the concepts that are embedded in it. So keep in mind that I believe democracy is this wonderful thing. It allows people to choose their leaders. In the United States, if people don't approve of the way the president is running the country, they have the opportunity every four years to vote he or she out of office and vote someone in. Similarly, the people could elect members of Congress every two years in the United States. It worked well, at least for the last 200 plus years. But you know, the question becomes what we're in this class wars, how did the democratic system come to be? How did we end up with representative government? And that's what we're exploring throughout this course. So we also have to look at the history of democracy itself in order to understand why our founding fathers created what they did. So how did it start? What were the highlights in its development? And this is what we're gonna be learning in this lesson. So, so I'm excited to present this to you because from this point forward, we're done with philosophers. We're gonna look at some documents. And then after the documents, we're gonna really dig into um, the concepts within the constitution and apply it to your real life. So super excited about that. So let's start off by using art to guide our studies, okay? So I'm gonna flash a picture um, up on the screen. I almost said I was going to flash you, but that would be totally inappropriate. So no, but I'm going to flash like a picture up on the screen. I want you to look at the picture <clears throat> and I want you to concentrate really hard. <clears throat> You're not going to see the picture very long. It's going to flash up there and it's going to flash away. And I'm going to ask you what you saw, right? What your images were. 
All right, are you ready? All right, what did you see? I saw a big storm and a girl and a bunch of people being affected by the storm. Okay, who else? It looked like maybe a f people fighting, like possibly in a war. Okay, who else? Yes, yeah, so I, I saw a war. <laughs> you yeah, saw a war? I saw a war too. Okay. I saw them sure was big use. So here it is. So this is the high middle ages. Uh, rulers fought for supreme power during this time. And this lesson is going to explore one document that sought to limit the power of the king. You're going to hear me say often that context is important when we're trying to understand the actions of those in the past. We have to put ourselves in their shoes, right? We have to put ourselves into the past to understand why, why it is that this was necessary. So today we're going to explore kings and how their actions are a specific king and his actions limit to the, to the limit of the king's power. In the Middle Ages, this was a time of war. And you can see in this depiction, it is war. And it's also the formation of new religions due to disagreements with the Catholic and the Protestant church. And individuals are seeking to challenge the authority with logic and science. So as you look at the picture now that you have time, do you see the king? Mr. Crane, there's people in the waiting room. Okay, I'll get to them. Do you guys see any, do you guys see the king? I think I see the king. Where is he? I, yes. I'd say he's in the left-hand corner. I think he's on a horse maybe. Oh, so you think he's over here? Yeah. How about right here? Yeah, he's uh, right there. Oh. Yeah, I think he's behind the right thing. Yeah, the crown. Like he's behind a tent or something. So if you look up in the middle, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you can see the king here, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's the king. You're going to notice that there's also lit religious symbols throughout here. Does anyone see anything symbolism of religion in this photo? A shield with a cross on it in the top. Absolutely, yeah. right? This is part of the Crusades. Absolutely. How about what people are wearing? Do you see anything that would indicate that religion is involved with the high Middle Ages during this time? There's a knight it that's standing like, yeah. next to the king that has a cross on his back. Okay, good. And there's a couple of robed figures below that might have been priests. At one point. A absolutely, right? Bishops, maybe, right? Priests, good. So it's important that you kind of sear this into your mind. This isn't a time of like gloriousness, right? Of any, any, any type of the imagination. This is a very hard time in the history. Very dark, very gloomy, very stormy uh, with kings ruling over the people. So let's move forward. So in the high middle ages, which span from the 11th to the 13th century. So we're looking from 1200s to the 1400s. The Catholic Church had considerable amount of power. And the Pope's influence uh, expanded to non-religious politics or secular politics and even into military actions. And in the 11th century, the Pope called for Christians to fight against the Muslims to claim the Holy Land in the Near East. Now, a holy war like this is what we refer to as the Crusades. And the kings heeded the Pope's orders. They followed the orders of the king. So keep in mind, we're talking about divine right theory, right? The closest person to God at one time used to be the king. But at some point in history, the Pope became a consultant for the king, which put the pope in a position above the king somewhat. So as these crusaders began returning from the east, fighting this war for the Catholic Church, they brought with them manuscripts and texts that had been composed by ancient Mediterranean societies. 
and these included the works of the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers. And so now you know why we took, look at, looked at Aristotle, we looked at Plato, right? You're starting to see that these documents are being brought over and the kings are starting to read them. And they're reading about science, they're reading about the stars, they're reading about math. And it's important to note at this particular time in history, education was reserved for peoples of the church, for the clergy. And it was controlled by the monasteries and due to the accessibility of these new texts and a need for literacy outside the church, non-religious schools developed in villages that were not under the supervision of the church. So this is a big, like, uh-oh for the church. We have people in the population that are now educated, right? And teachers begin to give instruction on classical education, meaning they would teach students to reason and debate ideas uh, with the writings of what the church was giving them and to compare those to what people in Rome and Greece had been writing. And so they were no longer relying upon the church for education. And they were armed with these classical ideas and people began to call for reform against the church. And they began to ask the question like, if we're gonna challenge the church, maybe we should also be challenging, maybe, just maybe, we should also be challenging what our kings are telling us. So one man saw an opportunity to gain from the lessening of this, this religious power, right? This Pope power, and it was King Henry II. And King Henry had many titles in his lifetime. He was known as like the, the Count of Anjou and the Count of Maine and the Duke of Normandy and the Count of Nantes, but mostly we know him as the King of England from about mid, 12th century or mid, yeah, 12th century, about 1150 through about uh, 1100, so about 50 years. And so Henry worked to gain English control over the lands that had been lost. He expanded to Wales, which is in the northern regions, if you've ever been there, and to Anjou and Domaine, and his expansion led him to fighting with King Louis VII of France. And as he took over these French territories, Henry recognized the church as a threat to his power. And this is really key, right? He began to notice that the church was a threat to his power. And he saw a problem in the treatment of criminals who happened to be members of the church. And this is a really key point because this is where we're, Henry and the church are going to split. And it's at this point that the king is really going to be challenged, not only by the church, but by religious people. And those people who follow the king are going to challenge the church. So we're going to start to have sort of this rebellion that's going to take place. So these members of the church, or we'll call them clergy, this is important, who were accused of a crime, of a non-religious crime in nature, did not have to receive the same trial as the regular citizen living in England. Instead, the members of the church, the leaders of the church, were put on trial in a church's court, in an ecclesiastical court or a Catholic court. And then that court, that church court, would give punishment to those individuals. Now, here's the key. These individuals, these courts, were forbidden from shedding blood. In other words, if a priest were to kill someone, the church could not execute them. They did but not believe in the death penalty. And so while a violent criminal, criminal would be punished by death in a royal court, and in an ecclesiastical court, he would have to, he could only remove the person from that office and they could stay there in the church as a member of the church and never be charged with murder. Now, of course, Henry, felt that the punishments of the church were not adequate. And, and I kind of agree with them, right? I mean, the church is letting their clergy members off the hook. And King Henry didn't like that. So he created something called the Constitutions of Clarendon. And it did not require clergy criminals to be tried in a royal court. 
And under the Constitution, the officer of the king would be present during the trial, the church trial, and immediately after the church trial, he would take that clergy member to the king's court and he would try them in the king's court. Now, this did not make the church happy at all. Now, there's a key point I want to make here. This is something we have in the concept of our Constitution known as double jeopardy. And in double jeopardy, it says you cannot be tried for a crime twice. And so what King Henry is doing is saying, look, you're not giving a correct punishment, and so I'm going to try you again in my court because I don't think the church is doing a good job. And the church is saying, time out, you can't try a man for the same crime twice. So what we're gonna find is, is that this concept of double jeopardy is gonna end up in our constitution later on, much later on, but our founders are gonna to point to this as an example of why we cannot have two separate courts and why we need to have a separation of church and state. Are you following me? Does anyone have any questions up to this point? All right, so King Henry II was succeeded by his oldest son, King Richard. Now you guys are familiar with King Richard the Lionheart because I bet you've watched some movies before that has King Richard there. Richard left to go out and to fight the Crusades for his father. And when he left England, he left the British Isles, he left his younger brother, John, in charge. Now, John was greedy, and John wanted more money to do the things that he wanted to do and to also finance his brother who was fighting in the Crusades. And so King John began to tax everyone the wealthy, and also those individuals who were poor. Now, I know you've heard of King John because all of you are familiar with Robin Hood. Am I right? Is there anyone out there that has not heard Who's of Robin Hood? Hood? You know who Robin Hood is. Steal from the rich and give to the poor. And you, I don't. You do. You know who he is. Come on, man. Everyone knows who Robin Hood is. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to see if I could get anybody to laugh. <laughs> okay, well, you didn't. You, you were unsuccessful, but good try. So Robin Hood, who stole from the rich and he gave from the poor, and we've seen the videos of old King John sitting there, and Robin Hood being angry. This is who we're talking about, King John. So the stress on like the money and the economic climate in England was really, really heavy on King John. And to add to his problem, he had this fight with the current pope who ended up excommunicating uh, John, told him to get out. And so John, hoping to build up more money uh, and not who has separated himself completely from the church, began to levy these huge taxes and the, on the barons as well. And the barons become very upset with King John. All right. So today's lesson is about King John. I kind of led you through who his father was, who was in line to become the next king, which was King Richard the Lionheart. King Richard goes off to the Crusades to fight. King John is in charge. Nobody likes King John because he's such an evil man, right? So we're gonna watch this video together. Uh, it's about 28 minutes. And I'm going to ask you, as we watch the video, in your notes, to do certain things, okay? If I can get it to pop up. There it is. So in your notes, I want you to write this down. We're looking for four different things. I'm looking for reasons, you to provide me with reasons when the video is over, of why King John would be considered the evilest man. I want you to pull from this short video examples of him being evil. Number two, I want you to be able to explain why you think King John had to sign the Magna Carta. Three, what was the Magna Carta? 
And then four, why is the Magna Carta associated with our Constitution? And I want you to be specific. Okay. I'm going to give you a moment to record those, to write those down so that you can record it. And I'm telling you, there are some really outlandish examples in here of how evil this guy was. Especially look for the one with the person who he, he marries later on. Ick. All right, so you should have that. Does anyone oh, yeah. have any, oh, do you need it back up there? Yeah. Okay. So again, five reasons he's considered evil. What was the Magna Carta? Why King John had to sign the Magna Carta? And why is this document associated with the Constitution? All right, are we good? Yep. All right. So I am going to reduce that. I'm going to stop share for just a minute because I'm going to make sure that I have clicked the right buttons. I have. Okay. Boom. All right. Again. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. Let me know if you can't hear it. In 1189, at Chinon in central France, King Henry II was dying. His empire, covering all of England and vast areas of France, was crumbling. What eventually broke the aging king, though, was not the rebellions which threatened his kingdoms, but the discovery that one of the leading rebels was his youngest and favorite son, John. John was a wonderful calculator, but in the end, there was something vicious in him, which is always going to come out, always going to smile to your face and stab you in the back. He was violent, he was cunning, he was witty and uh, fun, uh, but he was also not to be trusted. Throughout his 17-year reign, the man who would be known forever as Bad King John betrayed those closest to him, persecuted the innocent, and was the first King of England to be accused of murder. Writing after John's death, a medieval chronicler said of him, he feared not God, nor respected men. His punishments were refinements of cruelty, the starvation of children, the crushing of old men. His court was a brothel where no woman was safe. John's oppression was so widely felt that the legend of Robin Hood was born, the mythic outlaw of Sherwood Forest, who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Exaggerations, I'm sure, but they were effective exaggerations because they were widely believed. Driven to despair, John's subjects would try to impose a document on him called the Magna Carta, guaranteeing protection of their rights. John's refusal to abide by it would finally drive a desperate people into rebellion. I couldn't stand him. John makes so many people so fed up, so angry, so ashamed, humiliated, that they choose to rebel. And it's just an awful shit. John was born in Oxford on Christmas Eve 1167. The fourth and youngest son of King Henry II the head of the Angevin dynasty, a family of powerful nobles originating in Anjou in central France. Like William the Conqueror a hundred years before them, they controlled all of England and vast territories throughout France. He was born into the most powerful family in Western Europe. His father, King Henry II, uh, was not only King of England, but was also Duke of Normandy, Duke of Aquitaine, which is the whole of southwestern France, Count of Anjou, the rich lands in the Loire Valley, and, and was on the eve of invading Ireland and subjecting Ireland to his dominion as well. Henry and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, had three other sons, Geoffrey, Henry the Younger, and Richard, 
later known as Richard the Lionheart. As John grew up, that family fell apart, became a classically dysfunctional family. For John, bad relations with his brothers were exacerbated by the fact that as the youngest son, his claim to any lands and entitlements was always unclear. John was haunted by the fact that his father, King Henry II, gave him the nickname Lackland. To amend this in 1189, Henry gave the 18-year-old John the governorship of Ireland. One of John's castles still stands at Limerick in the Irish Republic. Whilst there, John exhibited one of his most notorious qualities. Two contemporary commentators comment upon his rapacity and avarice, that he wouldn't pay his soldiers, but seemed very keen to make as much money out of everyone there as he could. So right from the beginning, uh, avarice, greed, uh, is certainly one of the characteristics they pick up. They say they hope he will improve as he gets older, He's just a lad after all. The real troubles that beset that family were caused largely by his father's love for John and his father's wish to provide for John, a wish which left behind a trail of people who felt themselves to be disinherited in the interests of the youngest son of the family. Things would never change. Regardless of how much his father tried to help him, John's appetite for power would always outweigh any sense of loyalty to his father. In the last year or so of his life, Henry was facing great problems from his oldest surviving son, Richard, and the King of France, Philip Augustus, and Henry feared that they might be allying against him. John wasted no time in joining his brother Richard and the King of France in rebellion against his father. It was clear that the future lay with Richard, and therefore John, I think, is just looking to where the advantage is. But it does testify to a terrible lack of loyalty to his father. So I think there, that was just self-interest, calculated the future is with Richard, not with my father. Contemporaries wrote about this as the, the final straw that broke the father's heart, that he had gone through so much, he'd made so many mistakes for John's sake. And in the end, it was the son he loved who betrayed him. With Henry's death in 1189, Richard was now the King of England. And though generous to John, John felt no sense of loyalty to his brother. From the time of the succession to the throne of his surviving older brother, Richard, Richard the Lionheart, John was given fantastic wealth, particularly in England, but also in Normandy, and he was also Lord of Ireland. Now, if that wasn't enough for John, it just shows that it would have been impossible to satisfy him. What they don't really give him is the status of an Angevin prince. And so, from almost as soon as Richard sets off on crusade, we see him trying to cause trouble, or being drawn into the troubles which arise from Richard's absence. And he, in the end, took up arms and allied treacherously with the King of France. To John's astonishment, Although Richard had been imprisoned in Germany on his return from the Crusades, he eventually made it back. Worried, John immediately broke off his alliance with the King of France and begged Richard's forgiveness. John falls on his knees before his older brother. Uh, Richard is supposed to say, oh, come on, John, get up. You're just a child. You've been badly advised. Well, by that time, uh, he was nearly 30 years old. So not surprisingly, the French now felt they'd been betrayed by John, who had just betrayed Richard, who had betrayed his father. Amazingly, John still felt entitled to the throne and pressed Richard to be named as his heir. John's claim would have been completely unassailable had it not been for the fact that from 1189, as his father was dying, through to 1194, when his brother was in prison in Germany, John had a track record of treachery, which appalled contemporaries. One of Richard's main concerns was for his reputation, for his honor, so that he would do what honor required. John is clearly concerned to 
remain as rich as possible and as powerful as possible, but, but that honor, I think, never seems to cross his mind at all. Reputations notwithstanding, John would secure the throne. Wounded in battle at Chalus in central France, Richard died on April the 6th, 1199. On his deathbed, he named John as his heir. John is king by the grace of God. The records of his own household show that he didn't observe feast days, he didn't observe fasts, he ate meat on Fridays, he chatted during mass and everything like that. Once you've met John, it's very difficult any longer to believe this really can be a king by the grace of God, you know, because he's manifestly not a pious man. As king, John felt himself beyond reproach and free to have whatever he wanted when he wanted it, particularly when it came to women. His first marriage to Isabel of Gloucester in 1189 was annulled when she couldn't produce an heir. He then kept Isabel of Gloucester in the household or in his castles for the next 10 years. Isabella wasn't permitted to remarry. John wanted to keep her lands, though he didn't want to keep her. In 1200, John decided to marry another Isabel, the French heiress, Isabel of Angoulême. But there was one problem. She was too young to marry. The chroniclers say, I suspect with a certain tinge of knowingness, that she appeared to be about 12 years old. But Isabella could have been as young as eight or nine. A previous betrothal to Hugh de Lusignan, a neighboring baron, had been postponed because of Isabelle's youth. Hugh de Lusignan postponed the marriage until she should be old enough to marry. Then in comes John and takes her instead, ignoring the fact that she was not regarded as old enough to marry. He so alienated the local barons that thereafter the writing was on the wall, and from that sprang the rebellions that then swept John's territories from northern France off the map. John's high-handed attitude to women would also have huge consequences for him in England. Mistresses for a king is not lettery, that's just normal. The problem is that John goes after, against their will, the women in the families of the elite of society. Uh, he was accused of sexually harassing their wives and daughters. Robert Fitzwalter, for example, said that uh, King John tried to take his daughter by force. The other was William Longspeck. Longspeck had loyally gone out for John to fight for him at the Battle of Bouvain. He was captured, and while he was in captivity, John seduced his wife. I mean, all these kings were womanizers, but with John it had political consequences. Although only two years into his reign, John's reputation for treachery, greed, and lustfulness was beginning to dominate and destroy the lives of his subjects. But no one could imagine that John would soon go down in history as the first English king to commit murder with his own hands. By 1199, John was king of England. Having betrayed his father, Henry II, and his brother, Richard the Lionheart, John was finally in possession of the throne he had always coveted. There isn't any reason, I think, why if, if uh, John had behaved moderately sensibly, uh, he shouldn't have continued to rule that huge empire. Almost immediately, though, John's right to rule that empire was under attack. In 1202, the legitimacy of his succession was challenged by his young nephew, Arthur of Brittany. There's no doubt that the challenge of kingship at the beginning of his reign causes John great problems. Although Arthur was the senior one in terms of descent, in every other respect he was the junior one. He was much younger than John, he was only 12 years old when John becomes king of England. John succeeded in capturing Arthur and imprisoned him at Rouen in northern France. But in this moment of triumph, 
John made his greatest mistake. When you have to get rid of a member of the ruling family, it's a big, big deal to do it. And you generally try and find a legal process to go about it. John didn't do that. Accounts differ as to exactly what happened to Arthur, but it resulted in John being labelled as the first English king ever to commit murder. I think there is truth in this idea that John, in a drunken rage, simply lost his temper with Arthur. And I think John just flipped. That the red mist came down. It's a very, very stupid thing to do because the political values in, of the time in which John lived were values which said you cannot kill eight members of the elite, but John presumably thinks, oh, well, this is, you know, it's silly letting them go, they'll only come back and cause trouble again. I'm going to eliminate him. But it's just an example of John's clever deviousness, which is actually profound stupidity. The murder of Arthur was crucial. Uh, it stamped in people's minds this image of a tyrant, of a king, who would commit murder. The murder of Arthur of Brittany would dramatically affect the lives of those around him, and that of one man in particular, William de Bruce. We do know uh, that William de Bruce had been one of his most tr trusted counsellors for many years. De Bruce knew something about what had happened to Arthur. John decided in 1208 to turn against William de Bruce and to confiscate his property, to drive him into poverty and exile. De Bruce fled to Ireland and then to France. Out of his reach, John vented his anger on de Bruce's family. First of all, he impoverished de Bruce's wife, Matilda, by imposing an unpayable tax on her. And John, I think, what was it, 50,000 marks, 33,000 pounds that John demanded from her, an utterly impossible sum, which she has to agree to. And then when the king's envoys come to get the first payment from her, all she has is about sort of 13 marks and a few pieces of gold. Having failed to make their payments, John imprisoned Matilda and her son in Corfe Castle in Dorset. Here they were slowly starved to death. To starve her to, to, to death with her eldest son, it was just an appalling, terrible, terrible crime. It meant that all great landowners, pretty well all of whom were also in debt to the crown, had to fear that the law of the Exchequer might suddenly be turned against them as it had been suddenly unleashed against William de Bruce. John was beginning to lose the trust and loyalty of his subjects. Crucially, when the French king Philip Augustus attacked John's French territories in 1203, John could only rely on paid mercenaries to fight for him. There are various references to these mercenaries pillaging the lands around, raping knights' wives, stealing peasants' carts, and this is given by, by contemporaries as one reason why John alienates some of the, the knights and barons who have until then been prepared to fight for him. Castle after castle fell to Philip Augustus. In the autumn of 1203, John fled to England, leaving his remaining castles in Normandy to fend for themselves. Within a couple of weeks, only three castles are holding out for John, but John fails to come back, and so these castles surrender, knowing that they won't receive any help from John. John would never regain his French territories, but throughout his reign, he continually raised armies to invade France. To pay for this, he imposed huge taxes on his English barons. The very, very large financial penalties that John asks of people certainly very greatly increases in this period, and therefore the king can manipulate inheritances, technically the gifts of the marriages of widows and heiresses are in his hands. And it's not because he wants the money, it's because he wants to have this hanging over you, so that you know if you step out of line, the bailiffs are going to be in to get the money from you. You have to be reasonably sensible, perhaps even a good judge of human character, to be able to manage that political system well. But someone of John's character, I think, was clearly only able to make things even worse. Increasingly isolated and paranoid, 
John knew he could never expect his Baron's automatic loyalty. So he decided to use fear to guarantee it. You need ways of compelling them to be loyal, whether they want to or not. Um, and so you can either as you would get them in your debt and then say, well, look, I won't demand repayment. Or, uh, more dr dramatic still, of course, is you hand over to me your daughters or your sons or, and then I can be fairly sure of, of your loyalty. There was always the question, would the king actually kill the hostages? With John, after Arthur, um, well, the chances were that he might well kill the hostages. John did exactly that. In July 1212, he hanged 28 hostages, all of them sons of Welsh barons who threatened rebellion. Relations between John and his barons had deteriorated to such a degree that in 1212, there was a plot to assassinate him. And the idea was on the 1212 expedition to Wales to either to leave him to his fate or actually to kill him him there. And I mean, John heard about it just in time, shut himself up in Nottingham Castle, didn't go on the Welsh expedition, and was clearly badly shaken. In 1215, that hostility would culminate in outright rebellion. Forty English barons, led by Robert Fitzwalter, decided to confront John with a set of demands, effectively limiting his power as the king. They have to come up with something totally unprecedented. We have to develop a new kind of banner for rebellion, a program of reform, a charter of liberties, and so we get Magna Carta. On June the 15th, 1215, at Runnymede near Windsor, John met with the barons to sign the Magna Carta, but he had no intention of abiding by it. What John did at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215, was suddenly to bring the negotiations to an end and say to the barons, that's it, that's your lot, take it or leave it. John's attitude made civil war inevitable. A brutal year-long campaign was waged throughout the country. In January, 1216, John slaughtered the inhabitants of Berwick on the Scottish border as punishment for supporting the rebel barons. At Rochester in Kent, John personally directed the seven-week siege of this rebel stronghold. To torment the starving defenders even more, he ordered bacon fat to be smeared and burnt on the wooden props used to undermine the castle's west tower. The tower and the rebels' resolve soon collapsed. But total victory would elude him. In October 1216, whilst feasting at Lynn in East Anglia, he contracted dysentery. When he was dying, he clearly was a deeply, deeply troubled man. And you can see that from what he was buried in, because he wasn't buried in a crown. He was buried in a cloth cap. This is the cap which is put on a monarch's head after he's been anointed to keep in all the holy oil, all the oil which has poured into the monarch, the blessings of the Holy Spirit. It's what's called the cap of unction. It's absolutely sacred garment. John clearly had kept his cap of unction and he asked to be buried in it in the hope that somehow or other the oil in it and the blessings would waft him as quickly as possible through the regions of purgatory. He died at Newark Castle in Lincolnshire on October the 18th, 1216. All right, so let me get rid of my screen here and let me bring back up the PowerPoint that we were working on. Did I get the right, I get the wrong screen, didn't I? Sorry. All right, so give me five reasons that this guy is considered one of the evilest men in the world. He 
may have murdered someone. He murdered uh, uh, someone of who was uh, in the royal family. Yes, and there was no punishment. So rule of law is thrown out the window, right? He is above the law. He can commit murder and nothing will happen to him. What else? He was a wife stealer. He's a wife stealer for sure, right? What else? He betrayed his father. He betrayed his father by making alliances with the French. Good. What else? He was extremely power and money greedy. He extorted people and didn't pay his soldiers and the people under him. Good. What about marriage? He wanted to marry a 12-year-old. An eight-year-old or a nine-year-old really is what they really think. They can't prove it because we don't have like birth records back then. But yeah, because his first wife couldn't produce an heir. And so he decided that he was going to marry someone who could produce a child for him. Good. So why did he have to sign the Magna Carta? To protect the people's rights and to end the revolution that had started against him. Good. To protect not just every single person in his kingdom's rights, right? We're talking about the barons, people who own property, to protect their rights. So I want to make sure that's clear. But it's still a first step in the right direction to make him sign it, right? To limit his power in order, right, for them to live, to for have their natural rights protected. Because he was taking their property and taxation is a form of a property. Your money that you earn is property. And so when the government taxes you, they're taking your property away. And what King John was doing, he was get, taking a lot of money away from them. So the question becomes, what was the Magna Carta? What was it? A document it was a, that had to protect people's, people's rights. rights. The yeah. Law. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Both of you are right. So it is a document that limited, and this needs to be in your notes, it is a document that for the first time is really limiting the power of the monarch. Because of all of the treachery, all of the bad things that King John was doing, and when you start piling those on top of one another, it becomes essential for the people to say, you've gone too far. So within that document, we find that there are four important themes. And those themes are going to be found within our Constitution because we don't, our founders did not want to happen to us what had happened in the past to those in England. Because they knew their history, because they had studied their history. So we're going to look at these four key themes, and you're going to be responsible for knowing what these themes are, and hopefully, I hope that you'll be able to associate them also with the Magna Carta. So the first theme we've talked about before, and that is no person can break the law. It's this democratic principle that all people and institutions are subject and accountable to the laws of the land and that those laws will be fairly applied. And in our world today, that applies to our presidents. It applies to senators. It applies to our governor. It applies to our mayor. Just because you're in government does not make you above the law. You have to follow those laws. Does anyone have any questions about rule of law? Does everyone see why in the Magna Carta they had to limit the power of King John? Yep. Good. This is my favorite concept. Put a star next to it. It's called due process of law. It is a highfalutin title for something that's very simple. <clears throat> and if we break it down and we look um, at- I can't see anything. You can't see anything? Your screen no, said that it just started screen sharing, but it didn't do anything. Hmm. Well, let's try it. You again. might have to turn it off and do it again. Yeah, I'm going to try it again. Where do I get that? Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. You can see it? Yep. Yeah. All right, so you just see a white screen, or do you see, like, my note screen? Do you process I see notes. Notes. 
Fourth Amendment. No. Oh. No, we saw it. Huh. All right, well, we're just going to go off of this one right here then, because I don't think it's showing the page that I want you to see. But that's fine. You can see this, right? Okay. Yes. Is it small or is it big? What you see? It's the whole screen. Okay, good. All right, perfect. It is doing what it's supposed to do. Then due process of law. So when we look at like process of law, it is exactly that. It's the idea that from the time that a police officer approaches you, until the time that you're put in jail or found innocent, that there's a process that the government must follow, right? And that way it's fair to everyone. And it's this idea that all legal proceedings must be fair. So when a police officer approaches me on the street and starts asking me questions about something that I did, and he makes the determination that he or she is going to arrest me, what's the first thing that they must do? Tell you what you did wrong. Right. They gotta tell me what I did wrong and they've gotta read me my read Miranda my right. rights, right? They gotta read me my rights. You have to, does anyone know those? Does anyone know the Miranda rights? Not all of them. Is it right to remain silent? I think you say can and will be used against you in the state of you have the remind you have the right to remain silent and whatever you say will be held against you in court. And it will be you also used have the right to an law. attorney. Yep. 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 So those if are you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided but to you by the state. Yep. Those, those are your Miranda rights, right? That is part of due process. And so when we look at our Bill of Rights, it is Filled, and we're going to look at our Bill of Rights later, it is filled with due process of law that we don't necessarily get from the Magna Carta, but we get the concept and the idea of due process. So in other words, the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution says that they, the government cannot take your property away with, from you without a warrant. The Fifth Amendment says that no person can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so in other words, if they want to take away my home, it has to be associated with a crime, right? So for example, let's say, this is just an example, let's say that my parents owned a mortuary and I decided as their son to sell marijuana out of the mortuary. And then the FBI came in and they busted me and they, because I was selling drugs out of their business can the government take away my parents' business? What do you think? No. Yeah, they can. They sure can. You're a family member living in their house and you're selling drugs out of their business. This is part of due process of law. If they find that you were doing this with their knowledge, they could take their business away. If, um... Isn't the Fifth Amendment your right to remain silent so that they, no one can force you to incriminate yourself? It is. So it's, if you the Fifth, it means they can't really question you any further? That is correct. The Fifth Amendment is also, right, the right to remain silent, which is one of those Miranda rights. So when we look at due process of law, right, we know that this comes from the Magna Carta and it's in our Constitution today. Impartial jury a speedy trial, the right to remain silent. They cannot take your property away without a warrant, right? All of these things come from and stem back to the Magna Carta. That's its origins. All right, so let's move forward. Property rights. Is that what, is the Magna Carta where um, Montesquieu got his um, ideas from? No, well. Since he was like, He's, isn't he the one that came up with the creation of the different branches of the government? Yeah, I, I think that Montesquieu probably is reflecting upon history as all of these guys are, right? And they're looking at history and saying, okay, this needs to happen to prevent that. So I would say that this is probably taken into account as well. So property rights is just simply a declaration that you have the right to own property now, when we look at the Magna Carta, they were simply talking about barons, right? 
but we took it a step further. And that step further was to say that all people have the right to have property. And that your property cannot be taken away with you, from you without due process of law or without a warrant. All right. Well, all people except for women and for uh, people of color, but. Well, so. so in theory, right, it's there. So, so in theory, right, property rights in, were included. Now, if you're talking, if your statement is about when we first created the Constitution, you're absolutely right. When Thomas Jefferson, when those individuals created that Constitution, they were not taking into consideration uh, slaves or former slaves. They were not taking into consideration of women, but we're moving forward with that idea, right? That idea today that someday will aspire to that property rights and all rights will be afforded to everyone. I agree with you when we first start this country, for sure. Then the last part, fairness of the laws and their execution. Uh, in other words, there has to be equality. And we find this in the Magna Carta, that there has to be reasonable rules and regulations. There has to be equal justice under the law. We cannot just have this leader like King John kidnapping people and making you do things that you wouldn't have to do if he wasn't there. There's this recognition of customs and traditions and established rights like we have in the United States, and then this punishment in proportion to the crime. So we're gonna talk a lot about the 14th Amendment, a lot about it. And that 14th Amendment in the Constitution, it guarantees these equal protection of the laws, their equal opportunity as well, which Whoever that was that said it before, obviously Thomas Jefferson, obviously George Washington, obviously Madison and them weren't thinking of equality in its total form like we do today, but the concept of equality did exist. All right, perfect. Is everybody good? Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop share here. And, oh, you guys were lighting up the chat, huh? All right, so thank you. I need to have the chat open when I do that. Hi, Mrs. Dollar. Mrs. Dollar's here. Everybody say hi, Mrs. Dollar. Hi. Dollar. The last thing called. Hola. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a crazy bunch of kids you guys are, man. I can't tell you, I can't begin to tell you how much, even though we're not in the classroom, that I get an opportunity to present to you every day. It really fills my soul with like this happiness and joy that you're out there listening and you're responding. Life so, blood. so today, today, when I look at your assignments for today, um, have you guys looked at your assignments for today? All right, so let me look and see what I did assign because I'm old and I probably have forgotten by now. Hey, why? While you guys are here too, and while he's doing that, I would I wanted to make sure that does anyone have questions about annotations? Um, I just went through and graded your guys's Magna Carta article of annotations, and I uh, wanted to make sure if there were any questions. And also a reminder to those of you that have not done that, go do that. All right, no questions. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, can I talk to you, Mr. Heller, about or about that after class? Sure. Absolutely. So that's, that's all I have today. I hope that from our lecture that we had today that you learned that King John was this evil guy uh, and he did some horrific things. And as a consequence of that, that led to the writing of the Magna Carta, which limited his rights, uh, limited his powers, uh, which led to eventually our founders using that document as a basis uh, for creating 